mouth and worship the Lord. He's worthy of the glory. He deserves the praise today. Come on, everybody, all over the room, open your mouth and worship. Lift your hands and bless them in this place. another privilege to be in Bible study on Wednesday. We bless God for all of you that are here and uh, you have gotten your Bibles. I'm praying that you have. And so for all of you that are here, we bless God for your presence. For those of you that are going to join with us on the conference call, you can dial 515-606-5380. And then the access code is 636- Zero nine zero, and uh, we thank God for this another privilege of just being here uh, to try to learn the Word of God. And uh, I pray that you have brought your Bibles to sit down to go through the Word of God, so that we can learn as much as we possibly can. And uh, you know, this is just a journey that we uh, take. And for those of us that are honestly seeking God. You know, we have to understand that every day is something uh, new to discover. And so for those of us who are truly trying to find uh, God and trying to understand God as much as we possibly can, you know, reading and studying is the best way to uh, gain knowledge about Christ, about God, and all of the things that you have big questions about. And so I want to say that uh, nobody has it all. Nobody has all of the answers. Nobody, you know, have all of the information and inside uh, uh, re revelation from God. Uh, for the Bible simply says that we know in part and we prophesy in part. And so that's why it takes for all of us to come together. And so at the end of the day, you know, if you got something to help somebody, then certainly try to help somebody because we're all trying to find our way. The truth is this. You know, in the midst of us trying to find our way, you know, we have to be careful how we present ourselves because, you know, uh, you can't punish somebody else because they don't know what you know. You know, if the Lord has blessed you with a certain revelation that will, you know, that will help other people grow, then you don't, you don't smash them because they don't know it. You just try to love them to try to get them where they need to be because we're all on the course in this journey so that we can learn the things that we need to learn. And so... I pray, you know, that, uh, you know, you don't um, abuse anybody because that's not the spirit of God. The spirit of God is to try to help us learn as much as we possibly can because the truth about life is only you as an individual can determine what your relationship with God will be. And so uh, I, I humbly share information with people and hopefully that you go back and read your Bibles and try to find out what thus said the Lord because uh, I've, 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 you know, studied to develop my own personal relationship. And so you have to do the same. And so uh, I just come to you and share with you uh, information that I've gained and uh, hopefully it will help you in your quest for coming and just, um, establishing a relationship with God in a manner that will help you to survive uh, in this life and find true purpose. 
And so I want to continue with Romans chapter 8. And uh, we didn't get a chance to finish this on the last time that we studied. And so I want to take a look at it uh, and uh, try to see if we can kind of get through 8. Because 9 is where we're going to be next. But uh, there are some things that are, are still left in 8 that are, that are, per, uh, are pertinent to our understanding. And, and we really, really need to understand these uh, uh, things. And so I want to look at Romans chapter 8. And we're going to start at 28. And then what we're going to do is read down through 39. Uh, just for the sake of reading. Uh, because, like I said, uh, we're probably going to start further on down. Uh, but uh, I want to read it just for the sake of reading, all right? And so starting at 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate them he also called and whom he called them he also justified and whom he justified them he also glorified what shall we say then to these things if god be for us is probably where we're going to hang our hat today who shall be against us he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to uh, any charge to God elect? It is God that justifieth. Verse 34, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God. Who? also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, pearls, swords, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that love us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, and so we got, you know, the chance to read it all. And so I want to look at some things uh, concerning uh, this, uh, you know, uh, we're counted as sheep as slaughtered. And I uh, want to kind of back up and, and grab it uh, because I think that sometimes, you know, life becomes so difficult for us because we are in so much pain because life can be cruel. Uh, dealing with people and their own agendas and people who are just bad-hearted individuals can sometimes make your life a living hell. And so, you know, if you can't make sense of the things that you encounter, uh, it's hard to reconcile and it's hard to uh, pro progress this life and, and it's hard to kind of get this through your head because it seems as if it's just randomly happening, and yet everything that happens to us happens with purpose. But when you can't see purpose, it just seems like a random act. And so I want to look at it because uh, Paul so opens up in 28, and he tries to help gather our minds and gather our experiences so that we'll understand the totality of why we go through the things we go through. Because what he does in 28, he says, we know, okay? And he wants to put emphasis on we know because now, you know, life will make sense when you understand life from this perspective. He says, we know what? That all things work together. And when he says all things, he means 
the things that happens that are bad, things that are happen that are evil, things you can't explain. All of the stuff that has happened in your life has happened with purpose. But when you can't see purpose, it looks like a random act. And so Paul is trying to help you understand that you have not gone through anything that have not led you a step closer to the purpose of God in your own personal life. And so now when you look at this statement, he says all things work together for the good or for, uh, for good to them that love God. And so uh, he did not say it would feel good. And you have to understand, uh, it did not say it would feel good, but it, it works for the good. And you have to understand that it's only good when the things that happens to you pushes you closer to the purpose of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Because everything that has happened to your life in your life has pushed you even closer to vary the destiny of God and purpose of God in your own personal life. And see, this is what I think I need to deal with because when you look at um, uh, verse 18, uh, in Romans chapter 8, it says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed, watch it, in us. Because what he wants to submit now is that living in this world, you're going to have trials and tribulation. But the thing that keeps you while you're going through your trials is your love for God. Because when you look at verse 28, it wants to say all things work together for the good, uh, for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Because let's be honest, the only reason that we stick through the pains and the trials of our life is because our love for God. And if you really want to know one of the ways that you can truly understand you love God, look at all of the tragedies and look at all the hell you had to go through just because of what you believed in when it came to God. And so you can really uh, begin to evaluate your own personal commitment to God based on all the stuff you've gone through. And the reason you've gone through it sometimes didn't even make sense. But my God, the reason you got back up and you kept pushing along the way is simply because of your love for God. And let's be honest, man, we've gone through some stuff that we should have just walked away and scratched our head and just say, hey, I call it a day. But the truth of it is the love that we had for God wouldn't let us walk away from God because the more we went through, the more we began to see that without God, we would be able to survive none of this. And so even in our struggles, we begin to cling to God. Even the pain that we feel and the suffering that we have to go through, it drives us closer to the Lord because every time we go through something, something is revealed in us to help us understand that in this life, I will not be able to make it through the stuff that I go through if I don't hold on to God with all of my might. And so I'm hoping you understand that I, I was talking to one of my daughters uh, who is now uh, Pastor Chapman. I was telling her, I said, I said, baby girl, I said, you listen, I, I sometimes I don't understand why I got to go through what I got to go through. And sometimes I don't understand why God beat me the way he beat me. But I'm going to hold on to his leg. I'm going to hold on. I don't care how much he beat me. I don't care how much he take me through. I'm going to hold on God with all of my strength. God going to have to drag me with him. Okay. And so I gave her the picture of a father who has to whoop his child and the child is holding on to the father while he's getting a whooping. And I said, now that's what I look like. Because at the end of the day, I know that even in God's chastising of my own personal life, I realize that I won't even make it through his chastisement if I don't hold on to him. And so that's all I'm saying to you. Love is essential for the child of God because if you don't really love God, then your trials and your tribulations will literally make you walk away from God. But those of us who have suffered through so many things, have gone through so many agonies and so many painful experiences, and we still wake up saying, I love God, 
we still wake up with our uh, eyes lifted toward the hills from which cometh our help. You got to know that in that effort, there is an expression of love that says, God, I love you. And here's the proof. Uh, and so uh, you see verse 28, uh, which is very good. He says, for whom he did foreknow, and it's talking about God, he also predestined, all right, to become uh, conformed to the image of his son that he might be, Jesus, the firstborn amid, amongst many brethren. And it wants to help us to understand uh, that all of the stuff that happens to us uh, is actually leading us on a course that's going to eventually shape us into the image of of his son, Jesus Christ. And you find out that Jesus Christ becomes the expressed love, uh, not the private love uh, that, that, that we talk about because when we talk about love is expressed in two dimensions. Uh, it's, it's, it's what you feel and then it's what you express. And so nobody would have ever known how much God loved us because his love for us and what he felt for us was a private matter. It wasn't until God sent Jesus because Jesus becomes the manifestation of the love of God when he dies on a cross for a people who don't even love him or care who he is. And so what you see now is that when God is trying to shape us and trying to use these things that we go through to shape us into the image of his son, what he's literally trying to do is teach us how to love the ungodly. He's literally trying to teach us how to deal with the irritated. He's trying to teach us how to be long-suffering with folk who are short-minded, little-minded, light, little-tempered, and all of the above. He's literally trying to help us understand that the image of Christ is the manifestation of God's love towards humanity. And when God gets us to that place, we'll be patient with people. We'll love folk who don't love us back. You know, we'll help people who wouldn't help us because we're not here because we want somebody to help us because God is our help. We're here because God has ordained us and purposed us to be here to take care of those who wouldn't take care of us. And so you see, we're on a journey. Every one of us, we, you know, some of us may not understand how far along the journey we are on, but if you belong to Christ right now, you are on a journey that God is going to reveal himself to you every time he get a chance so that you finally come into the purpose in which he called you here. And so that you begin to operate in your purpose and operate in such a way that people will know that you are a child of God. Watch what he does. He goes into verse 30, he says, moreover, whom he did predestine, then he also called, all right? And that's what we have to understand. You know, we came into the world, we was living crazy, you know, doing all of the kind of stuff, you know, we wanted to do. And uh, I, I'll say this, uh, you know, you have to understand uh, because God is the author of life. Uh, he's the only one that's got the rules to life. And we spent the first half of our lives living you know, this life with no rules. And so we end up damaging ourselves in such a manner that it is, it's almost difficult to even see you being recovered. But God, uh, when he let you go through that, knew you was going to have those moments, but he was going to lead you to a place where he was going to get your life and turn it around. And so now that you are a believer, you've got to understand that it was God that led you here so that he could bring you into his fold and begin to teach you how to live the life that he's literally given to you, okay? And so you've got to understand all of this stuff work together. I wish you'd just say all of it. All of it works together. Uh, even your childhood, the stuff you've been through, stuff you can't explain, stuff you won't let go. You see, you got to understand that when the devil came after you, he wasn't trying to hurt you. No, the devil was trying to kill you. And that's why the Bible says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Because the devil wasn't trying to hurt you. He was literally trying to kill you. But every time he tried to kill you, you walked away with a wound. And when you walked away, that, in, that encountered that the fact that he didn't proceed in what he tried to do. He tried to kill you. 
And so at the end of the day, you can praise God because after all the stuff you've been through, you see, you survived it simply because you have been ordained. You have been predestined uh, to walk away and to be what God has called you to be. And so he called you. And then the next thing he says, he justified you. And then he's also, he said, he glorified you. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Watch what he says in verse 31. It says, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now think about what that says now. If God is on your side, name one person that can defeat God. And you can't come up with one, okay? Because if he is the creator of all things, then nothing that you can name that can come up against God and defeat God. And so if God be for us, that means we're already winners, all right? Uh, and, but we don't see life that way because we uh, operate in the lack of faith too many times and we end up allowing the devil to get the victory because we don't have confidence in the God we serve. But let me show you what I mean when you say, if God be for me. If God be for me, if God be for us. And Paul tries to show us this in the midst of all of Romans. So what he does here is he, he, he talks about uh, in Romans chapter one, he talks about uh, all of the people in the whole wide world uh, that have no excuse because of the creation, God shows his glory. And so if you don't believe in God, it's because you choose not to. Then in chapter two, he talks about the Jews who have the law. And even though the Jews had the law, they didn't obey it. And so uh, at the end of the day, uh, he talks about uh, them and then in chapter 3, he condemns the whole world. He says, all have sinned and come short of the glory. But what he does in chapter 3 is he shows us that God literally gives to us his righteousness because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, I want you to go to Romans uh, chapter 3, 20 and 26 is what I read for you. Okay, I want you to see this uh, for yourself. 3 and 20, uh, we'll start at 20 and we'll stop at 26. Here's what it says. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the, without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe it. There, I'm saying, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a perpetuation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness to the remission of sin that are passed through the forbearance of God. Verse 26. To declare, I say, that this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believe in Jesus. And so in chapter 3, you see God gives, giving to us his righteousness. And so when you talk about righteousness, what does that you know, truly mean? And so in simplicity and, 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 and hopefully in just uh, simple terms, righteousness is really having a desire to walk right with God. How can, you know, two walk together except they agree? And so this righteousness that he talks about, uh, that he gives to us, is a desire to walk right with God. And so you see righteousness, saints, uh, 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 we don't have any righteousness of our own because the Bible says our righteousness is like filthy rags. But when we have faith, God gives to us his righteousness. And that righteousness that he gives has a desire in it which causes us to want to walk right with God. Uh, and the Bible says, he that the thirst and hunger after righteousness shall be filled. And so at the end of the day, you know, you got a hunger and you got to feed this hunger every day to try to be right with God. And so that's the first thing that he gives us. The second thing that he gives us is he justifies us. And that's found in chapter five. He says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access to by faith into the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. 
That's chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. And so he gives to us his, uh, justifies us, and he gives to us peace with God. Then he goes into chapter 6 and he talks about how he uh, frees us from sin, all right, by the death and the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's uh, found in uh, chapter 6, and I'll read that, uh, verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Okay? And when you read that, it wants to help you understand that God has delivered us from uh, 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 sin, uh, uh, the, the, he's freed us from sin, and now we are freed from sin. We got to know that we don't have the right to just live any way we want to because we've been freed. God freed us that we might become servants of the Most High God. God didn't just free us so that we could live reckless life, reckless out here. God freed us so that we could be free to carry the mantle and the purpose by which he has called us as believers and children of God. And so you see that. And then in verse 7, he talks about the law, how he's uh, delivered us from the law. He has pushed us into the form of grace. And then you find out in chapter 8, he starts talking about uh, there is no, there is now no condemnation to them that walk in the spirit, not after the flesh. And so uh, he wants to help you understand all of the stuff that God has done. And so when you look at 31, what he wants to say now, that if God has gone through all of this trouble, just to get you where you are, then what else would not God do to help you be everything that he ordained for you to be? And see, this is what we struggle with because we, we don't spend a whole lot of time in the word of God. We are so busy trying to live life and so busy trying to just survive. And uh, I talked to my brother uh, the other day. He said, man, listen, uh, we're talking about the working poor. The, the average person are, are, are actually two checks away from being poor, two checks away from being able to take care of their households. And, 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 and saints, the truth of it is we are out here struggling every day trying to survive. But might I submit that God never intended for us to survive. God intended for us to strive. And we don't strive because we are so consumed with the world's principles that we can't even see what God is trying to show us. And so let me show you this real quick because I want you to understand this. I want you to go uh, to Matthew because, you know, we read scriptures and sometimes it don't make sense to us uh, because, you know, uh, it just don't make sense. But uh, I want to see if I can make some sense of this because it helps, it helps really for you to understand what God intended for you. See, while you're struggling, trying to survive, you know, God got a plan for your life. And, you know, instead of you running to God and asking God to reveal something to you, you know, you busy trying to survive on the world's principles. But but let me see if I can I, I can get this. Uh, uh, verse 24 of, of Matthew chapter 6. It says, no man can serve two masters. Neither uh, for either you will hate the one and love the other. Or else you will hold to the one and despise the other. You, ye, we cannot serve God and money. And so he opens up like, he wants you to know that, you know, you got to make a choice. Either you're going to run after God or you're going to run after money. Because when your attention is divided, the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And so what he's saying here is that we're going to have to make up our mind. Either we're going to work for God or we're going to work for ourselves and try to survive in this world. But here's what happens when you work for God. Watch what the Bible says. Therefore, I'm in verse 25. I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Now pause, because he's talking to those who will decide to go after God. He wants to submit now that if you come after me, he says, don't worry. He said, take no thought for your life. Uh, I, 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 I've heard this uh, a lot of times, but I want to read it because I want you to see what he's saying. He says, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink. Nor what ye, uh, uh, and yet for your body, what ye shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. And so he wants to submit then that 
uh, your life is what's important. And so at, at one time I heard uh, one preacher expound upon this and he says, if you read this contextually, uh, it wants to submit that uh, when you get down to verse uh, 33, it says, uh, uh, six, uh, what is that? Uh, third, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. He said, if you read that contextually, it simply means that God will take care of your clothes, your food, and your housing. Okay? But I read it, and I want you to go back and read it again. The first thing that he says is take no thought for your life. Okay? And he includes, watch this, he includes house, he includes clothes, and he includes food, because when you look from a psychological place, a point of view, these are the most concerns on any person's life, because when you are in this world as a human being, those are the first three things that you're concerned about. But once those things are satisfied, your mind automatically moves to another place of concern. And so that's why he uses these three things, the house, the clothes, and the food, because that is the first three things that every human is concerned about. And God says, look, when you work for me, I'll make sure I take care of your food, your house, uh, your clothes, and whatever else that you're concerned about. Because when you work for me, then I'll most definitely work for you. Watch this. It's, it goes on and gives an example. It says, Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not. Neither do they reap, nor gather in the bones. Yet your heavenly Father feed them. Are ye not much better than they? He gives an example. I'm going to stop because I, I keep t uh, 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 preaching. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his statue? Okay? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the fields, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet, I say unto you, that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Okay? And so he gives wonderful examples. Go back and read it. It's wonderful. I don't have time to expound upon it, but I'm just saying these examples are good. Uh, it says, wherefore, if God so clothed the grass, of the fields, watch this, which which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? And then he and then he he, he, he kind of hit us, oh ye of little faith, because he's trying to say now, these birds that fly, the lilies that 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 grow out of the ground, uh, the grass that grows, he says now God takes care of all of that. And he wants to submit now that even though God takes care of all of the earth and the grass and the lilies, he said, are we not more than that? And so if God will take care of the grass, then he wants to, sub he wants to su submit that God will certainly take care of us because all of the stuff that he's talking about, God made for us. And so if he's going to take care of that, then certainly he's going to take care of us because of his love for us. And we've got to have the kind of faith that trusts God in spite of all the stuff we wrestle with. Now, I'm trying to hurry on, but watch this. Verse 31, therefore take what? No thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or whithersoever shall we be clothed? All right, and he used those three items again. For, all, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your, watch this, heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of what? All these things. And so if God know you got all of these things and you need all of these things and him being a good father, will he not provide? Of course he will. But it's not that he won't provide. It's just that you have worried yourself to death over stuff that you should have left up to God. Okay? And uh, I don't know if you got kids, but I got, you know, I got kids. I got, I got my, my birth babies and then I got my other babies. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I love them all. And uh, uh, the one thing I've discovered by raising my kids in my house is the fact that they grow up, they get up, they play, they do all the stuff. They go to school, they come home, they eat, 
They 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 do all the kids do to go up to their room, they slam the door, get in their bed, get their laptops, and they they cool. And uh out of all of the years that my children have been in my house, not one time can I remember any of my children coming to me asking me, Daddy, how you gonna pay the mortgage? How you gonna pay the bills? How you gonna pay the insurance for the cop? Okay, I got I got my, my daughter a car, I got my son one. He didn't want to learn to drive. He just not learning how to drive. But 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 I'm saying my daughter never came to me and said, Daddy, where you got the money from? Because because of the faith that she had in the ability of me being her father, she never had to question where it was gonna come from. She just knew it got done. All right. And so all I'm saying to you is this is that this is the kind of faith we got to have in God. You know, we, we don't ever want to ask him how he's going to do it. But when he says he's going to do it, you got to trust that if he says it, then God will certainly get it done. Watch this, y'all. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, you know, we're struggling in, out in this world because we didn't realize that God's got some, some things hooked to our purpose. Watch what he says in verse 33. He says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. All right? Watch this. Because what he's saying here is this. While you're sitting around struggling, trying to survive, he said, I never meant for you to survive. He said, I meant, I meant for you to thrive. But because you're consumed with money, trying to make money, trying to make things work, trying to make sure everything happens like it's supposed to. And when you ain't got no money, you fall apart. He said, but when you make a choice to follow me and to do what I ask you to do. He says, I eliminate those worries for you. And when you seek ye first the kingdom, when you make that number one in your agenda and his righteousness, stay in right relationship with God because it's hard to do God's work when you're not in right relationship with him because he has to lead and direct and guide your heart on what to do and what not to do. And so those two are very important because when it comes to working in the kingdom, we've got to follow the king, all right? And so uh, God has already uh, devised a plan that will make your life easy. I was telling somebody the other day, what would life be like to have a job you love doing? See, I, you know, at the end of the day, y'all, I, I would not, listen, I, I would do this if nobody paid no attention to me. Because it's what God has made my heart rejoice in. It is what I love. It is what I, and I thrive in. It's what God has anointed me to understand. And so even, you know, uh, out of all of the stuff that I do and God has called me to do this, I bless God that he put me in a place where I can do what I was called and ordained to do and yet get covered and taking care of everything that I need in the process of. Because what would you, what would your life be like if you had a job that you love coming to simply because you were gifted to do it. And while you were gifted to do what God has gifted you to do, they gave you a paycheck to cover you. You see, there's nothing in the world greater than having a job that actually fits your gift. And we work a lot of jobs, y'all, because we want money more than we want to respect the gift that God has given to us. Because if you have a heart for people, there are so many jobs, all right, that fit your compassion. And even though the check is necessary, your job won't seem like such a, a stressful job when you love being with people and helping people and nurturing people and doing what God has called you for people. Because at the end of the day, you'd have done that for free. Matter of fact, you even do it when you ain't at work because it's so much a part of who you are. You just do it. You see strangers that you will help and you don't have, you don't sometimes don't understand why you do it. It's because it's a part of who you are. And when you got a job that causes you to operate in the gift that God has blessed you with, then life becomes a little bit less stressful, a little bit less worrying. Because when I do what I love to do, I'll do it even when there ain't no check of cash to it. Because at the end of the day, the Lord blessed me that somebody loved me enough to see what I was doing and it was valuable. And now they put a monetary gift to my gift, all right? And now I can take care of all of the stuff that I need 
and still do the stuff I've been called and purposed to do. And watch what verse 34 says. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow. Hello? Don't you you worried about you worried about a day you might not even get. <laughs> you, you, don't, don't take no thought for tomorrow. For tomorrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Why are you worried about tomorrow? My mama used to say it all the time, and, and I, I, I share it, and I still say it even to this day. When I get up and talk to my daughter, I say, well, you know, I'll holler at you tomorrow if it be the Lord's will. Because, y'all, while your mind is consumed about tomorrow, which, night, which may not even come to you, you have missed all of the joy of today because you've allowed your mind to outrun you and get to a place, all right, that you may not even encounter on tomorrow. You have literally allowed your mind to push you into an era that you may not even experience. And then on top of that, if God does wake you up to experience, the stuff you're worried about may not even happen the way you want it to happen or the way you pictured it's gonna happen because you just allow your mind to lead you. And y'all, and what I'm trying to help people understand is that the first thing we're going to have to do is get control over our mind. We have to bring our mind into submission. How do you do that, Reverend? By the word of God. The word of God is what helps us to keep our minds under lock. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let me show it to you real quick. My time is running out. Boy, I tell you what. Um... When you when you when you're on the road, it just the time just run out. And so, uh, uh, watch this. Second uh, Corinthians ten and four. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse five, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against, watch this, the knowledge of God, uh, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And y'all, here is, here's how I want to interpret that. Show me a man that don't have the word of God in it, and I'll show you a man that's filled with confusion. Because what this text wants to submit is that the word of God is what gives order to the mind of the believer. The word of God is what gives standards and departmentalize the stuff you are concerned about because everything you will ever encounter in life can be found in this book. And when the word of God is in the mind of the believer, it wants to submit that the word will bring every imagination and everything that you're stuck in, it'll bring it down, all right? It will cast down imaginations, as the Bible says, I think in verse 5, all right? And every high thing, or uh, every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And so at the end of the day, it wants to submit, y'all, that when you got the word of God, what you got is a police in your mind that will help you arrest the thoughts that are not according to the agenda of God. And the police, which is the word, will arrest those thoughts, bring them on captivity, and put them in jail so that you can focus and keep your mind focused on the right stuff. Because y'all, let's be honest, most of our confusion comes because we got no regulations on how to make sure our thoughts don't drive us crazy. And so at the end of the day, if you don't believe the word of God works, I dare you to try it. Because the word is what brings comfort. The word of God is what gives direction. The word of God is what reveals the mystery of God to you and your purpose in life. It's the word of God that heals the very broken heart. It's the word of God that gives insight about God, who he is, what he has done, the 
power he, he has, the, the, the character in which he exists. The word of God shows you the love of God, how much he loves you, when he loves you, how he chastises because he loves you. The, I mean, I can go on, but I'm trying to show you it's the word. And all I'm trying to do as a man of God is introduce people back to the word. Because out of the years I've been in church, uh, I've been in church since I've been about 12, and what the one thing I've noticed is that church folk know how to have church. And what I mean by that, they come to have a good time. But you know what I'm, I, I found out as I'm growing up what was missing? That after all these people had a good time and they were shouting and they sweated their hair out and, you know, uh, their, their, their beautiful uh, costumes and all that kind of stuff, uh, uh, they had no knowledge of Christ. And so as soon as they finished shouting in the service and when they walked out the door, the devil was out waiting for them because when the devil hit them, they had no word to fall back on. All they had was a good time and the feeling they had in church. Because when they got home, their lives fell apart because they had no word. And so now that the Lord has called, raised me up and put me in a place of position, I'm saying to myself that if people are going to have a what we call the abundant life, it can no longer be church people having a good time in church. I Listen, I am not against having a good time. Don't miss it. I'm not against having a good time because I think every, I think praises ought to always be to God. But after the good time is over, you better have some word in your head. You better have some word in your, in your heart so that God can direct your life, give your life purpose, show you what he's doing in your life so that you don't get frustrated and you don't get discouraged. So you better have some word in your belly because people are going to challenge you on what you believe and the average person in the church cannot even tell people what it is they believe, okay? And so you got to know that you got to do some work. And the Bible says, listen, study to show thyself. I think that's what the Bible says. Approved. And so while the preacher is up preaching and teaching on Bible class nights, you still got your part to do, okay? Because my study enhances my relationship your study will enhance your relationship and i want to submit that if ain't much studying going on ain't much relationship being established and i can tell you this for those of you that have encountered the coronavirus and have gotten through this okay you better know that it was only because of the relationship you had established with god Okay, now there are some folks that didn't make it through. Okay, and what I mean by that, you know, this, this tragedy and the stuff that they're going to encounter, they're going to literally walk away from God because they had no word to keep them in times like this. Because when you are in places like this, all we have is God and faith in the God that we trust. Because when it's all said and done, that's going to be the power and the hope of the believer to be able to get up after all of this is over, dust ourselves off, re-channel, refocus, and hit the ground running again. Because at the end of the day, when you got faith in God, he will give you hope and he will restore your heart. He will restore all of the broken pieces if you just bring it to the altar and leave it with him. God bless you and God keep you. I'm going to stop right there. Uh, I still didn't get a chance to get through all that. Uh, and so uh, we'll, we'll probably have to go back again the next time the Lord uh, uh, give us a chance if it be his will. And so uh, I hope something has been said to help you tonight. Uh, my time has run out. And so for anyone that have heard this message today, and you want to come and give your life to God. Uh, we are always opening our hearts to you. Uh, and all you have to do is inbox us your name and your phone number. And our membership academy will get with you to find out, you know, what church you want to be a part of because we're not trying to force you to come to Zion. We're just trying to get people saved. Amen. And so we thank God for you being on the end of this broadcast today. And I hope something has been said to help you uh, to just kind of understand this thing, you know, call life a little better so that we can be all we need to be. 
I don't forget every day, every day. One o'clock, all right, we are all in prayer. Uh, and the motto is family that prays together stays together. And Lord knows we need to stick together and stay together. Because after this is over, we have ministry to do, okay? And so I pray uh, that uh, you have been praying uh, because Matthew, not Matthew, but Luke 18 says, men ought to always pray and not faint, all right? And I want to submit that if you're praying, you ain't fainting, all right? And if you're fainting, you ain't praying, okay? And so pray, saints, because prayer is necessary. And I'm hoping through the course of this that we develop a prayer life. It's not just something we're going to pray just to get through the pandemic, but we develop a prayer life so that prayer is just like breathing. I can't, I can't wake up without it. I can't live without it because talking to God is necessary on a daily basis. And so God bless you and keep you. Can we pray? Gracious and kind Father, we thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to look at your word once again. And God, I pray that you take this feeble attempt and bless your people. In such a way, oh God, that the words that have come across this media, that it would find the right ears in the right places, and that the seeds would be planted in the right spots, that it produce fruit. God, I pray now that you take this feeble effort, of effort and use it to your glory. And everyone that has heard this message, oh God, that you would bless their ears to be able to take this word and understand it in the form in which they are able to understand it. Because God, I know that it is a living word and you will tailor yourself to our education in such a way that we will be able to understand what it is you would have us to know. And so God, I pray that you bless every person uh, in this world, God, look upon them. God, we need to know you in the pardon of our sin. And for those of us that know you, God, help us to get closer to know you even more. Help us to have a hunger and a thirst for your righteousness. And that you be glorified in our lives. And we'll be careful to give you praise, glory, and honor. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Uh, um,